Jordan. I want to play a game. The TV in front of you will play the entire Saw Octology back to back. Watch them closely and provide detailed story recaps. Fail to do so and you'll never be found. Live or die, the choice is yours. Alright, fine. The first movie opens with two men waking up in what appears to be a pretty typical Arby's bathroom. You know, dead body with a gun and a microcassette player in the middle of the floor and all that. And weirdly, if you look closely, you can definitely tell the dead guy on the floor is, is breathing. Not sure if that matters or not. The two guys are also chained to the wall, unable to escape, and not really sure why they're there other than because, you know, Arby's has the meats. We quickly learn that the first guy, who looks exactly like the Dread Pirate Roberts, but with with more pit stains, is actually Lawrence Gordon, a surgeon and apparent philanderer who has a wife and a daughter, and the latter of whom has just just a massive tootsie. Oh, what a big tootsie. The other guy is Adam, who wrote this movie and went on to write and direct Upgrade Invisible Man, which, which both slap. The men have almost nothing in common, except they both suck ass at throwing things. <laughs> The two men find microcassettes in their pockets and use the dead dude's player to give them a listen. Adam's microcassette says he should try and escape, and Lawrence's says he should try and kill Adam by 6 o'clock. But the games begin! Adam discovers two hacksaws in the toilet, and they realize that the easiest way to escape would be to saw their feet off. The twisted nature of their situation reminds Lawrence of a serial killer named Jigsaw who was never caught. Then flashback! Detective Steven Singh, Allison Carey, and David Tapp, who is way too old for this shit, inspect the grisly aftermath of a sweaty dude unsuccessfully climbing through a bunch of razor wire. It turns out this was not a sexual mishap, but rather a horrible test devised by an unknown serial killer who the police are really quick to point out isn't technically a killer because he merely arranges little games where people technically kill themselves technically, which uh, I'm totally sure would technically hold up in court. The cops dubbed the killer Jigsaw because they had cut little Jigsaw pieces out of their victim's skin. We also know Jigsaw's intentions because there's a tape explaining to the sweaty dude that because he tried to kill himself and therefore clearly doesn't appreciate life, he will now have to crawl through a bunch of razor wire in a set time limit. If he survived, presumably he would learn to appreciate life more and wear a lot more sweaters to cover his inevitable horrific full body scarring. But he didn't survive, so I think the lesson was lost on him. One of Lawrence's pin lights is found at the scene of the not technically a murder technically, and so he becomes a prime suspect. It never comes up, but Lawrence also owns a huge ass jigsaw puzzle piece clock, which Seems like a red flag. Unfortunately for the police, Lawrence actually has a rock solid engorged alibi in that the night of the slain, he was slaying some pussy that wasn't his wife's. But the police still ask Lawrence to hear the story of somebody who did survive a jigsaw trap, a drug addict named Amanda. Amanda was forced to cut open the stomach of a dude to grab a key that'll open a reverse bear trap on her head. But that is way easier than crawling through razor wire, sawing off your own foot, or I'm gonna guess any of the other million traps in this horrible franchise. Amanda claims the experience of hurting somebody else has actually helped her get clean, so I guess that counts as a jigsaw trap working? Not sure how that metric applies to the opiate dude laying on the floor who had to die to teach Amanda's lesson. I'm not sure how he's supposed to escape his drug overdose and learn to appreciate his life, but okay. Anyway, with that videotape that Jigsaw used for Amanda, Detective Tap guesses the location of Jigsaw and he and Singh forego like securing a warrant or getting back up and they just bum rush the warehouse of a known booby trapping mastermind in the middle of the night. And as expected, it goes poorly. Singh gets shotgunned to death and Tap gets his throat slashed, but, but not to death, just a light, like a jig slashing. And this is the part of the movie where I started to wonder where Jigsaw gets the money for traps and extremely detailed dioramas. Also, how much did that evil robe cost? Like, what store carries coats like that? Did Jigsaw sew it personally? For a serial killer, their craft skills are through the goddamn roof. But, okay, that's the end of the flashback that I had totally forgotten was a flashback by this point. Presently, Lawrence's wife and daughter are tied up by a man watching Lawrence and Adam in the filthy bathroom through some camera. 
Simultaneously, it turns out that Tap went crazy after the death of his partner, got fired from the force, and now full-time stalks Lawrence, still under the belief that he is the Jigsaw Killer. In the bathroom, Lawrence finds a box with a one-way cell phone, which I think is usually just called a baby monitor, but the box also has two cigarettes, a lighter, and a reminder that he really needs to kill Adam already, and also the blood of the guy on the floor is presumably poisoned. The implication here seems to be that he should dip a cigarette in blood and then give it to Adam to smoke, but surely Adam would see and or smell freaking blood on a white cigarette? But it doesn't matter because Lawrence tricks his captor by flicking off the lights and whispering a warning to Adam so quietly the microphone doesn't pick it up. He then turns the lights back on and throws Adam a non-bloody cigarette, which Adam smokes and then tries to win a Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. <laughs> the captor isn't fooled by this big brain scheme and electrocutes Adam through his chain to wake him back up. Oh, and apparently the guy who captured Adam and Lawrence moonlights as an orderly at Lawrence's hospital and is named Zepp Hendel when he isn't crawling around in a pig mask or taking down the Dharma Initiative. But he's not the only weirdo here because we suddenly learn Adam has also been stalking Lawrence and taking pictures of him because he was hired by TAP. And if you're keeping score at home, that brings us up to three people simultaneously stalking Lawrence. Lawrence eventually delays killing Adam for so long that Zepp is forced to kill Lawrence's wife, but twist! Zepp is weak as shit, and he gets his ass handed to him. Even more helpfully, one of Lawrence's many stalkers, Tap, sees the gunfire and runs in to stop Zepp. Unfortunately, Tap forgets this isn't the video game control, and guns have a finite amount of ammo. <laughs> Lawrence's family escape to a nearby Indian family, and Tap chases Zepp to the Arby's bathroom where the boys are. Unfortunately, nobody stopped to explain any of this to Lawrence. He just hears gunshots and screaming while speaking with his wife over the phone, so he freaks out, cuts his own foot off, and then shoots Adam with a gun on the floor. Tap catches up with Zepp, who shoots Tap dead, and then Zepp comes into the room to kill Lawrence because there are rules, but twist again, Adam didn't die. And even though he's been shot, remember, Zepp is weak as sh and he allows Adam to beat him to death with a toilet top. Lawrence army crawls away for help and almost certainly bleeds to death after like 10 feet or 10, 10 foot. But then, in the biggest twist of all, remember the dead guy on the floor I noticed was breathing at the beginning? Well, he's alive, which it it explains the breathing. His name is John Kramer, and he is, in fact, the Jigsaw Killer. It turns out Kramer has a brain tumor as well as nerves of ice because he never once flinches, even as people shoot each other, beat each other to death, scream, and generally throw sh** everywhere. He hates people who don't value life and so has been devising traps this whole time to learn people some zest for life. Zepp was just another victim of this, and his trap was to, I guess, basically be jigsaw for a day while Kramer took a nap on the bathroom floor because Kramer also values efficient delegation. Anyway, Kramer leaves the bathroom and a still shot still tied up Adam behind. He also turns off the lights like a real asshole while Adam screams over the credits. Game over. Can I get some food or something? There's a jar of peanut butter in the corner, but you'll notice I've covered the floor in spikes. You yeah, these are Dorito crumbs. <laughs> Game over. Oh, so Saw 2 opens with a guy wearing a reverse reverse bear trap on his head. So, a bear trap. But, but, but if he doesn't pluck a key out of his eyeball, he'll die. And he dies. Almost immediately it's apparent this movie is not directed by the guy who went on to helm massive action films like Fury 7 and Aquaman. Because the first movie had a lot of interesting camera pans and transitions. And this movie tries its best. I'll be right there. What do you got? The now dead guy was a police informant who worked with semi-disgraced police detective Eric Matthews, a man who looks suspiciously like a somewhat deflated Mark Wahlberg, and who makes me wish this important middle-aged white guy character had a more distinctive name. Eric has a son, Daniel, who steals things and hates his dad, and the boy's mother is Eric's former lover and plays no part in this story. Sir, not appearing in this film. Apparently, Eric used to be partners with Detective Allison Carey, who showed up sporadically in the first movie to deliver tiny bits of exposition, and, uh, she has a much larger role in this movie in that she delivers much more exposition. And semi-disgraced though he may be, it appears Kramer wants Eric to look closely at this murder. He deduces this because it's spray painted on the ceiling. Eric eventually realizes that the metal on the reverse reverse bear trap has the name of a factory on it because I guess they manufactured these for commercial use? Or maybe Kramer himself branded the piece of metal specifically so Eric could feel clever when he solved its origin? 
Why not just spray paint the address on the wall? But anyway, Eric Allison and Officer Daniel Rigg, whose personality is best described as bandana, bust into the warehouse and, of course, get booby-trapped. Because again, the guy's whole thing is booby traps. He's Kevin McAllister with cancer. After removing the dead and injured cops, they head upstairs to find Kramer and a bunch of computer monitors displaying people trapped in a house, including Eric's son. I think that's my son. Alongside a big dude named Xavier, a nice dude named Jonas, a stupid dude named Gust, an apparent semi-disgraced Padawan named Obi, a whiny lady named Laura, a hot lady named Addison, and a repeat lady named Amanda from the first movie. Too many people. Apparently, Amanda's returned because even though she doesn't do drugs anymore, she has started cutting herself. The game is they've got two hours to find a bunch of antidotes spread throughout the house that'll prevent them from dying from some slow-acting poison seeping through the vents. Apparently, there is one in the safe they're all looking at, but the clue they're given is too cryptic, so Gus takes a key that they are expressly told not to use on the door, and he uses it on the door. Rip Gus. Next, it's revealed that Obi captured them all for Jigsaw, a la Zep. Rip Zep. But then I guess he got captured himself like a goof, but it doesn't matter because he catches on fire to death five seconds later. In another room, there are a bunch of syringes in a pit, and Xavier chucks Amanda in to find a key that'll open a door, but she's too late. At some point amidst all the catching on fire and getting syringe, they realize they've all been incarcerated thanks to evidence planted by Daniel's cop daddy. They get kind of mad at Daniel, but Nobody really cares that much, to be honest. Eventually, Xavier realizes they have numbers on the backs of their necks that theoretically correspond to the code on that safe, but instead of politely offering neck massages, Xavier hunts everybody down, though they kind of just all die on their own. Xavier kills Jonas, but then Laura just dies from the gas for no reason, and then Addison dies in a trap that really is not fair at all. Xavier comes for Amanda and Daniel, but the two escape through a door under the safe, which opens to a tunnel leading to the bathroom from the first saw. And just like any other Arby's bathroom, it has not been cleaned anytime recently. And before finishing them off, Xavier cuts the number off of his own neck, again, rather than just like ask them to look for him. And then Daniel kills Xavier with a rusty saw, thereby, you know, justifying the title of the movie. During all this, Eric chats with Kramer, who is really driving the point home that he never technically killed anybody technically, which is becoming a catchphrase about as believable as human centipedes 100% medically accurate claim. Kramer explains that back in the day, he suicidally drove off of a bridge after learning of his terminal cancer, but doing real life burnout actually just made him feel alive. Then Kramer made the logical leap that he should torture people in insanely elaborate traps so they can feel like he did. Eric is bored by this story and slaps the old man around and breaks his fingers. Kramer cries uncle and agrees to take Eric to the house. Immediately after they sneak out though, the tech team hacks the computer monitors using reverse hacking and they determine the location of the camera feeds. So everybody quickly drives to their respective locations, but it turns out the police team goes to a different and shockingly unbooby trapped house where they discover a bunch of VCRs and realize they've been watching a tape this whole time. The events of the movie actually happened days ago. Meanwhile, Eric and Kramer drive to the correct house and Eric makes his way down to the dirty bathroom only to get needled and knocked out by another pig person who just happens to be Amanda Twist. She's been working with Kramer this whole time. Apparently, she enjoyed cutting that dude's stomach open so much, she decided to join Kramer. Of course, the real shocker here is how superb her acting skills must be. I mean, she almost dies at a million different points and gets thrown in a freaking needle pit, but at no point says, Actually, I'm in charge of this game, and I'm going to go home and wash these needles off of me. And nobody suspects otherwise, because who would willingly put themselves in a jigsaw trap for real? But hey, at least her involvement serves no clear purpose for the game at all. I guess if she was doing anything, it was protecting Daniel because he's been stuck in Kramer's safe back at the warehouse the whole time and is totally fine, give or take the, you know, severe PTSD he will have for the rest of his life. If Eric had just listened to Kramer's full story and let time run out, the two would have been reunited. Instead, Eric is chained up by Amanda in the same bathroom as the first movie where he's presumably left to rot. Just like what I imagine the real Mark Wahlberg did to the real Donnie Wahlberg when they were kids. What? No. Amanda claims that even after Kramer dies, she'll continue his work. And we end with a shot of Kramer looking dead in the passenger seat. But if there's anything the first movie taught me, it's that this dude is amazing at looking dead. Acting runs in the Jigsaw family, apparently. <laughs>
All right. Uh, Saw 3 opens basically where 2 left off with Eric trapped in the bathroom. He considers sawing his foot off, but decides he doesn't have the stomach for something so awful. So instead, he smashes his foot to shit with a toilet top thing, which is still extremely gruesome. He slides his broken foot out of the shackles and wanders down the hallway. Then we cut to Lieutenant Rig, who is apparently promoted despite letting Jigsaw escape and Eric disappear. And Rig and his boys bust down a door at an abandoned school to discover a guy apparently exploded by Jigsaw. He calls in resident Jigsaw and exposition expert Allison, but she's skeptical it's a true Jigsaw trap because the door was welded shut, meaning that even if the dude had escaped from uh, all the chains stuck in his skin and his frickin' mouth, he still would have exploded. That seems unfair, and if there's one thing we know about Jigsaw, he's a very fair and very reasonable guy. But unfortunately for Allison, that's basically all the exposition this movie has, so she's immediately captured and gets her rib cage ripped open in another unfair Jigsaw trap with no actual escape option. With that relatively important character forever eliminated, we flip to a pill-popping doctor named Lynn, who's having a rough time with her lover Chris, a name I can't, I can't remember even though I... I literally just said it. She heads to the hospital, saves a kid's life, and then also gets kidnapped because Jigsaw wastes freaking no time in this movie. Lynn wakes up in a room with a still alive, gurney bound Kramer and a surprisingly whiny Amanda. They strap a bomb collar to Lynn's neck and demand she keep Kramer alive while another victim completes a test of his own somewhere else in this other freaking warehouse or her head will explode, literally. Anyway, that victim is a 40 something white dude named, and get this, Jeff. My name is Jeff. Jeff's son was killed in an accident a while ago, and the manslaughterer received a relatively light sentence. Jeff has been obsessed with getting revenge, at the expense of being nice to his daughter, and Kramer decides that's bad enough to force Jeff into a whole series of traps designed to teach forgiveness, because Kramer teaches lessons the way we all wish our dads would. The first trap involves the only witness to his son's death who didn't actually help testify, tied naked in a freezer because one of the producers realized they'd gone two whole horror movies without displaying any gratuitous nudity. She's sprayed with freezing water and the only way for Jeff to save her is if he reaches through some cold pipes to kind of stick to his face. He never thinks to cover his face, apparently. And none of it matters because Jeff wasted the first few minutes yelling and shivering instead of, like, giving her his coat for a second while he got the key. So she dies, and he just leaves. Only things changed are kind of bad ice burn on his face and the fact that he's, like, goosebumps now. And while this is going on, Lynn apparently has to perform some crazy brain surgery to keep Kramer alive for another 20 minutes. Also, Amanda is getting weirdly jealous, as if the woman with the bomb collar on her neck is going to want to have sex with the serial killer dying of cancer. But anyway, Lynn succeeds after what feels like a 12-hour sequence of what I assume was 100% medically accurate brain surgery. Jeff's second test features the lenient judge from his son's case tied at the bottom of a pit, slowly filling with pig guts. To save him, Jeff must willingly let his late son's memory burn up. He does this and saves the judge just before he gets bacon lungs. We're treated then to a Saw signature flashback where it's revealed Amanda was actually the one who captured Adam in the first movie, even though Zepp was doing stuff at the time too, and not to mention Kramer, so again, really great delegation. Less cool, Amanda killed Adam herself. Adam would have died anyway, but Amanda is a perfectionist, I guess. Also, we learn that she actually is cutting herself, so maybe she was actually being tested again in the second movie. But she also seemed to know everything about the test, which according to my high school math teacher is cheating. Maybe it's both. It's hard to see what that little detail adds other than a little bit more blood. We also see her kill Eric even after he escaped from the bathroom, which again, cheating! I'm just gonna say it, Amanda's a cheater. And all right, back in the present, Jeff has his final test, which features what Jigsaw claims is his personal favorite trap, but I have my doubts because he barely watches this one while in the first movie he literally gives himself a front row seat to the entire sawing event. But whatever, the guy in the trap is the medical student who ran over Jeff's kid and his arms and legs will be twisted off unless Jeff pulls a key out of a box that'll trigger a shotgun. Weirdly, Jeff succeeds without being injured at all. However, the judge inexplicably stands right in front of the shotgun hole and dies despite being very aware of what was happening. Also, once again, slow ass Jeff is way too late and the guy dies anyway. And I'm wondering if Jeff's son would have been fine, but it took Jeff like seven years to get him to the hospital because he's evidently the slowest man on freaking earth. Jeff's lethargy really 
Doesn't matter, though, because he technically succeeds in that he didn't, like, fall into a hole or knock himself out on a pipe while walking from game to game. And since Kramer is still alive, Kramer tells Lynn she can leave. But, of course, weirdo Amanda shoots Lynn in the stomach. Why? Who knows? Maybe it's because Amanda drank this can of energy drink. Regardless, Jeff walks up on the scene and reveals that he and Lynn are actually married. Jeff's kind of peeved that Amanda shot his wife, so he shoots Amanda in the quickest decision he's evidently ever made. And time. Well done. As Amanda bleeds out, Kramer claims credit, like he planned everything to ultimately test Amanda because he knew she was killing people and setting up unfair traps, and as he says, he despises murderers and has never murdered anybody, which surprisingly doesn't feel more true the more times he says it. Amanda failed that test and is now shot, and Kramer now wants Jeff to forgive him too. Jeff says no and saws Kramer's throat because every movie has to end with a saw. This causes Lynn's head to explode. Before he dies of saw throat, Kramer plays a tape that says Jeff's daughter is trapped in another room somewhere, presumably meaning he now has to play a whole other game to find her. What exactly did Jeff do that warrants like 30 tests when most people just get their dick hacked off in like two minutes? Also, we're now three movies and like 50 traps or whatever in, and now that Amanda failed, Kramer's games have worked zero times. Not a single person has had their life changed for the better. But that's okay because we got five more chances to see if it ever works! <laughs> mm. My peanut butter is sticky. <laughs> it's now soft four, and I'm starting to think that this Latin numeral titling system is a little pretentious. Like, who do they think they are? Grand Theft Auto? I'll have two number nines. A number nine large. Even more upsetting, the movie opens on Jigsaw's dead dick, which is probably the most horrifying trap in the whole series. Kramer is being autopsied, and as the doctors peel all of his non-4 skin back, they discover a tape inside Kramer's stomach claiming his game will continue. Kramer's tummy tape specifically calls out one of the other background middle-aged white detectives who has been floating around on the periphery of this series named, wait for it, Mark! <laughs> Apparently, he's gonna get tested, too. Also, spoiler warning, uh, this movie makes no damn sense. We cut to two men stuck in a surprisingly uneven trap. One guy has his eyes sewn shut, and the other guy his mouth. They're both chained to a thing winching them together, and they end up fighting because the sewn mouth guy can't explain they need to work together, except, like, you can definitely say something with the amount that he's able to open his mouth, and the mouth guy rips open his mouth anyway at the end. But whatever, mouth guy kills eyes guy because of course he did. You don't need to talk to club people to death. Seeing, much more helpful. You f***ing hear me? You f***ing motherfucker! Also, fun fact, this is, as far as I can tell, the only trap set in an abandoned Italian villa. Ooh, fancy. Meanwhile, Rig and Mark discover Allison's remains from the last movie, and uh, actually no other cops die because they're finally smart enough to send in a robot to check for booby traps. Then yet another middle-aged white FBI agent named frickin' Peter shows up with his partner, Lindsay, who is neither white nor a man for a nice change of pace. White Peter believes there is another accomplice in addition to Amanda and Kramer because those two are weak as shit and could never have hoisted Allison's just, just massive caboose up into the trap. Rig then goes home and runs into his wife, who's leaving to hang out with her mom. Rig goes to sleep, but wakes up to an entire jigsaw trap set up in his freaking living room, complete with a hot lady getting her hair pulled out. He frees her, but she tries to kill him, so he kills her. He also learns that Eric from Saw 2 is actually still alive, because Amanda didn't actually finish him off, and Eric and inexplicably Mark, I guess, are now trapped in yet another abandoned warehouse. Eric stands on slowly melting ice, and once it melts, he'll hang, and the melted water will interact with some wires and electrocute Mark somehow. To save them, Rig must perform a series of tests intended to end his obsession with hunting Jigsaw and teach him to spend more time with his wife and see the world how Jigsaw sees it, which does feel like competing lessons. But anyway, Rig has 90 minutes to learn this lesson about putting family before work, even though it takes most of our dads a full lifetime. Good luck. Rig finds a key to a motel and leaves to go see what fun that'll lead to. It turns out it leads to the fun of a rapist guy that he must force into a trap that'll cut all the rapist's limbs off. And because he doesn't blind himself fast enough. Great. Rig then ends up at the same abandoned school from Saw 3 that I guess 
still isn't being watched despite being home to a literal bombing murder like four days earlier. But whatever, this school means something to Rig because he went there once in the past to investigate the abuse of a student by her father. The mom covered for the shit dad so the kid got no assistance other than Rig punching the dad right in the damn nose like a hero. The dad threatened to sue, but the charges were dropped after Mark, who I guess was Rig's partner, claimed that Rig was attacked. But today, Rig stumbles upon a jigsaw or you know, whoever trapped with that same mom and dad impaled together. The mom in non-lethal areas and the dad in lethal areas. If the mom pulls all the rods out, she'll live, but he'll die. It's a metaphor for codependency, see? I mean, it's elegant and it's subtle, but it's there. Anyway, by the time Rig gets there, the mom's gotten basically all but one rod out and asked him for help, and Rig instead hands her a key and tells her to help herself, which is a very jigsawian move. The FBI agents, for their part, are also trying to find Mark, and obviously also Rig, and are sort of vacillating between thinking that Rig is killing people on purpose and thinking he's just a pawn in Jigsaw's game because, as Lindsay points out, technically, nobody kills anybody technically, and technically, they're all choosing to kill themselves technically. And, and honestly, maybe these cops deserve to die if that's their general view on how the justice system should work, or, or maybe just retire, I'm not crazy. Yet... Thanks to a clue, the feds interrogate Kramer's wife, Jill, who reveals that even before his big cancer car crash, he was definitely going to become a serial killer because a meth head accidentally killed his wife's unborn child. See, Jill runs a drug clinic to help people, but clearly drug addicts need to help themselves, and I guess run their faces against knives, because that's what Kramer forces the guy who accidentally killed his kid to do. It's the only way to get clean, don't you know? And uh, interestingly, this particular torture causes the meth head to sound exactly like Adam Sandler. <laughs> Side note, the night of his kid dying, the sex worker from Saw 2 propositions Kramer hard enough for him to determine that she should die in a few months or years or whenever that movie happens in relation to this one. I think they're all happening at the same time. And also, maybe I'm just imagining these movies. Okay, this... It's getting complicated. The cops are one step behind Rig the whole time, and at the motel, they realize the room has been rented to a lawyer named Art Blank. Art disappeared a couple weeks ago, is Jill's lawyer, is the sewn mouth guy from the beginning, and is running the ice block game with Eric and Mark, who I honestly had forgotten about. Oh, and we learn Kramer ran an urban renewal project for a while before becoming all libertarian and deciding poor people should fix their own problems. And then I guess he converted all that property to torture warehouses like a libertarian. The FBI agents eventually arrive at the school that, again, was a jigsaw crime scene like four days ago, and they've already forgotten the booby trap thing because they trigger a crossbow that kills some random woman, and Lindsay gets up close and personal with a puppet that explodes all over her face. No game here, Jigsaw just, you know, is being a dick. Peter runs back to Jill, who is still in the interrogation room, and demands answers. Jill reveals that her and Kramer's son was supposed to be named Gideon, not after like a biblical character or like the angel, but after one of Kramer's meat packing plants. Meaningful. So Peter runs over to the unborn baby meat packing plant not called Planned Parenthood, and Rig also runs there, I guess, and the ice is about to melt, and then, oh look, there's friggin' Jeff from Saw 3 wandering around too. Apparently three and four are happening simultaneously? There's no way Jigsaw could accurately time all that. But whatever, Peter shoots Jeff in apparent self-defense three seconds after Saw 3 is technically concluded, technically, which, I mean, cool, I guess, but also now nobody knows about Jeff's daughter who is locked in a room somewhere. I mean, does that count as murder, Jigsaw? Or is it her fault if she doesn't eat her own legs and stops breathing when the air runs out? No time to think about that because the three dudes in the ice block room realize that if Rig opens the door before 90 minutes, he'll accidentally kill them all. See, Rig's whole game has been about not saving people and letting them save themselves. Also, at some point, I guess Art handed Eric a gun, so when they see Rig heading for the door, Eric shoots Rig. Why Art didn't just, like, stand by the door and yell at Rig to not come in, or just push something in front of the door so Rig couldn't open it is never explained. So Rig opens the door anyway, which triggers a couple other ice blocks that smash Eric's head completely flat like a pancake, making him presumably fully dead, but... I mean, you never know. All my life, I seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Rig then shoots Art and lays down on the floor, sad and shot, and then Mark gets up from his chair and reveals he's yet another freaking Jigsaw accomplice, continuing the grand tradition of sitting in his own trap for two hours to create an epic twist with no purpose. Mark then leaves Rig to die on the floor and locks Peter in 
whatever room he's in now. And then the movie reveals that Jig Dick autopsy scene is actually in the future, which like, wow. So Mark is about to be tested by Jigsaw, despite like, like basically being Jigsaw at this point because these movies are dumb as shit. Also, I've lost count of how many people work with Jigsaw to capture people and rig them up in traps. I mean, what are the odds that all these randos never fail or get caught? Like, do they take a course on kidnapping? Does Jigsaw have a masterclass they all need to watch first? How am I only halfway through these damn movies? Saw 5 opens up with a dude getting his stomach sawed in half by a big blade because I don't know who gives a shit. Honestly, at this point, just, just saw me in half. Uh, was this supposed to kill me? No, shut up. Okay. Your body will never be found. So yeah, the guy is a former convict as have the vast majority of the people in these traps and it's, it's like pick another thing, dude. How have there been zero politicians in traps so far? Jigsaw hints that he hated them in the last movie. At least these people presumably did time and pay their debt to society, but whatever. Anyway, again, we watch the end of three, which is also the end of four, which is also the end of my tolerance for this achronological bullshit. It's a game, Tweaker. Mark locks Peter in the room with Kramer's body, but Peter notices an exit and a tape recording and gets nabbed by a pig head and stuck in an honestly pretty uninventive trap where he just slowly drowns while water gets dumped on his head. There's not even a moment where they pretend he could escape or anything. It's just an inefficient way to murder somebody. Even the water stored at basic ass office water coolers. Somebody's murder trap budget has been freaking slashed. Fortunately, Peter's actually kind of brilliant and gives himself an emergency tracheotomy so he can breathe even with his head underwater, which actually is pretty cool. Maybe the coolest thing in this whole series so far. Meanwhile, Mark saves Jeff's daughter because Yay, they didn't forget about her. And then he walks out of the warehouse claiming he saved the day and everybody else has died. Of course, Peter didn't die and also walks out, but Mark, who we know is evil, is labeled a hero. And Peter, who I, I just realized was in Gilmore Girls. People grow and evolve their whole lives. Well, he's taken off the case. And what the case is, is unclear because as far as anybody knows, Jigsaw is dead. Jigsaw murders are over. But maybe that's just like cop speak for vacation. Like, I could really use... Get taken off the case right now. Side note, Kramer has left a box of unidentified shit to his wife, which is handed to her by a lawyer, even though I'm like 100% positive that murdering 50 victims means you're not allowed to wield your possessions to people without the police inspecting them first. Like, that's evidence. That's the first way we learn that this is a shit lawyer. And the second is he asks to see what's in the box like a curious 12 year old. Like, be a professional, bro. You represent a serial killer. Show some restraint. So Kramer's dead. Finally, for real, for real. Which means he can't personally build new traps. But we see Mark set up an elaborate game for five new people. So back to the masterclass thing. How do these jigsaw knockoffs know how to build such elaborate traps? They never use the same trap twice besides the reverse bear trap. And so how are they also creative and good at welding? And also, where are they getting the money for this stuff? Did Jigsaw have a company credit card they're just passing around? Anyway, Mark gets promoted and the FBI isn't invited to the ceremony. And shut the hell up, Miss Jenkins. It's not today, Miss Jenkins. And we learn that Lindsay Perez from the last movie died off screen because presumably she wasn't middle-aged white dude enough. Meanwhile, the aforementioned five people are trapped in a room with collars around their necks. The people aren't sure how they're all connected to each other, but this is a jigsaw trap, so obviously they are, and I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that the answer is they all played a part in a fire that killed eight people. And I would wait longer to reveal that fact, but it doesn't matter because the fire has literally nothing to do with anything else in the series. But anyway, the keys to unlock the collars are right in front of them, but if they pull too hard, they'll jerk everybody else back and cut their head off on some blades. Go too slow, and they'll all explode. Four of them grab a key successfully, and one has their head fall off. In the next room, they need to smack a bunch of jars to get a key, but there are only three pipes in which to hide from an impending explosion. They let the big fancy British man smash all the jars and then betray him so he explodes. In the next room, they must close an electrical circuit, so they just murder one of the remaining women and attach everything to her. In the final room, they're told to stick their hands in a saw blade thing until they've got enough blood to fill up a jar with a little fish bobber. And they realize that if they'd work together with the rest of the people, instead of betraying them one by one, nobody would have needed to die. And each trap would have been much easier, including this last trap, because they could have spread the blood around. The series of traps has nothing to do with the rest of the movie other than, you know, saw blades. 
Cause it's Saw, baby! And while that's happening, Peter retreads the first movies as a thinly veiled excuse to show the audience how Mark was there all along helping out Jigsaw, which like, could have been an email, dude. No need for 30 minutes of runtime. Thankfully, they also clarified that Amanda needed to be in the gas house from Saw 2 to ensure people followed the rules. The assumption being that if somebody had tried to cheat in Saw 1, I guess Kramer would have just gotten up off the floor and called a timeout. We also learned that they never wear gloves while setting up traps, which might work fine for Kramer, but Mark is a cop. His prints are 100% on file. But then again, the whole police force is dead, so... I don't know, close logic hold, Jordan, you idiot? Game over. We also learned that the first guy killed in this movie wasn't killed in an official Jigsaw trap, but rather by Mark pulling a copycat before he started doing official Jigsaw murders later on. That dude killed Mark's sister, and as a result, Kramer captures and ultimately recruits Mark to be his new best friend. He explains that Mark's trap sucked ass, and he didn't even use good steel, even though, like, it worked fine. The guy's very dead. Also, for the millionth time, Kramer says that he finds killing distasteful, and, like, yeah, dude, I've watched you kill like a hundred people in the most disgusting ways possible. It's distasteful as shit. I don't think these movies are meant to be watched back to back. But anyway, simultaneously, yet another middle-aged white dude named frickin' Dan, who is, I guess, like the FBI boss or, or king or something, he sneaks after Peter because he thinks he might be a Jigsaw accomplice, while Mark steals Peter's phone and plants evidence to make that theory appear more viable. Also, Jill randomly shows up and claims Peter is following her, I guess? And the movie ends like the last one, with three men converging on a single location. Dan finds the survivors of the fire game and more evidence seemingly pointing to Peter being a jigsaw accomplice. Peter finds a tape that tells him to get into a box full of glass or he'll die, and Mark finds Peter. The two scuffle, and Peter throws Mark into the glass box, which of course allows Mark to survive when the walls inevitably close on Peter and swoosh him. So like, what about that test that Mark was supposed to do or whatever at the end of four? Like, why does it always take at least two movies to resolve any hanging plot threads? Surely they wrote this whole franchise in like one awful night at a slasher themed LA Halloween party in 2004. Hold your breath for five seconds or you'll die. Right now? Okay. <gasps> <sighs> God, damn, should have done longer. You may be mistaken. Anyway, Saw 6 begins like many of my fondest college memories, with a big dude in a cage sawing his stomach off across from a woman cutting her arm off, and both placing their respective body parts on a scale in the hopes that their meat weighs more than the other's meat, so a thing on their head doesn't drill into their brain. I could almost taste the stale beer and horrific viscera. Mark, again like me in college, watches this passionately. Then he heads to the uh, box room where he just apparently squooshed Peter and finds an unsquooshed Peter hand. And even though that's essentially exactly where the last movie ended, Mark, I guess, also had time to kidnap those two people and set up another elaborate game while squishing Peter, or maybe, like, immediately after. He is a busy bee. But, so yeah, he uses Peter's disembodied hand to plant a couple of fingerprints on the eyes of the guy who recently died from the unfortunate combination of extreme weight loss program and extreme screw in the brain program. Those fingerprints pretty much cement Peter as the primary suspect. We also learned that Lindsay Perez survived her clown to the face from four that we thought she died from off screen in five, so twists abound, boys and girls. She and Dan learned the knife used to cut a cute little puzzle piece out of the victim's body wasn't Jigsaw's normal one, and in fact matched the crime scene of uh, Seth Baxter, who killed Mark's sister in the last movie. How did they piece that together? Because this morgue guy has looked at every single jigsaw victim body, okay? I was the one who examined that body. I've examined every victim of the jigsaw killer. The cops also start using some uh, fancy voice descrambling technology on one of the tapes, which seems like a good idea. That might have been an even better idea like six movies ago, but... Better late than never, right? And meanwhile, we're introduced to another middle-aged white dude with a spicy name of Will. Fortunately, he's a little more distinctive looking than most, but unfortunately, his job is finding little discrepancies in health insurance applications so as to void them rather than pay them out later on. As such, he becomes an inevitable target of Kramer's as well as critics who believe this movie about people hacking their stomachs and arms off contributed to the debate on healthcare reform, which... I hope not. One of the first things Will says when denying somebody coverage is that they chose to fill out the forms wrong, which 
is exactly something Jigsaw would say, but the movie supposes they're different here. It's a confusing comparison. Also, we finally learn what Jill got in her box from the last movie. Six envelopes. Also, I guess she knows Mark because she gives him five, but not six of the envelopes, which, like, could there be a betrayal happening here? Obviously. Oh, and twist, Amanda was one of Jill's crackhead patients back in the day, so cool. Okay, then Will gets captured, though not before accidentally shooting an innocent security guard we never see again, and Will gets put in a thing and whatever, it's a game, and he has to do four other, dare I say, many games, or all his limbs will get blown off as punishment for creating an algorithm to test whether a person will be worth giving health insurance. Basically, if they seem healthy enough, bring them on. If not, let them die. That's not very nice, but Kramer also says that his algorithm is flawed because you don't know how hard people will fight to live. You're not accounting for the will to live, Will. And this is presented like some kind of brilliant insight, but Will still wouldn't want to provide health care coverage to people who get cancer but then fight it like hell for 40 years. He wants people with zero will to live who will fall over and die as soon as they step on a Lego. I don't think Kramer understands how health insurance works. And also Kramer again mentions how evil politicians are, but like never tries to grab one? That's a bit hypocritical, Jiggy. Put your reverse reverse bear trap where your mouth is. Anyway, Will's first test is to hold his breath longer than a 50-something smoker. This is an actual Kramer jigsaw trap at this point, which means it's supposed to be sort of fair and teach a life lesson or whatever, but have we really stooped to the level of killing smokers? The dude has no other apparent issues with his life. He's a freaking janitor. That's a piece of sh move, Kramer. Really, I am starting to think that you're an ass. This also emphasizes what's becoming kind of a new theme in these movies, which is most of the traps now involve multiple people and often trials by combat, which, like, is usually inherently unfair. At other times, there's just innocent people involved that get no say in whether they live or die, which, again, I thought that was, like, the whole point. The choice is yours. But whatever, Will wins because obviously, and the janitor is crushed to death in what I'm sure was a massive blow to the tobacco industry. In the next room, Will is forced to choose whether a middle-aged woman with kids gets hung to death or a younger employee who Jigsaw says over and over has nobody who will miss him. He shows a bunch of pictures of him, like, sadly sitting on benches and shit to prove his point. Will chooses the woman because why wouldn't he? It's also here where we notice that these traps are getting downright Disney level in their production. I mean, animatronics, uh, complicated electrical light-up systems with fun levers and buttons. I mean, Jigsaw has become very whimsical and fun in his death. In the next room, Will helps his lawyer navigate a steam maze by also getting hot steam in his face from time to time. And at the end, she is told Will has a key in his stomach, so she tries to saw it out of him. But he beats the shit out of her because, again, she's a 120-pound woman, and he's an adult man. As far as we know, her only crime is informing her boss of the law. Next room, six employees sit on a merry-go-round and will get shot in the chest one by one unless Will presses a button to save them. He can only save two, though, so it's a tough decision made tougher by the fact that the machine stabs his hand every time he presses the button and the employees are all so freaking annoying. It's a legitimate toss-up whether any of them are worth saving. I'm healthy, sir. I'm healthy. He ends up saving the two hot women, so good choice, Will. While this is going on, the movie sporadically cuts to a mom and a kid we assumed was Will's family, but who are actually the widow and half orphan of a guy he denied coverage. Now that Will passed all of his tests, they have to decide whether to kill him or not. The mom decides not to because she's not an absolute sick freaking monster, but apparently her teenage son is, and he pumps Will's bodies full of acid. Also, we learned that this movie was set in an abandoned zoo because this entire town is abandoned. I'm gonna guess that the last movie is set inside an entirely abandoned Canada. I guess I should also mention that Miss Jenkins, who was told to shut the hell up in the last movie, has now written a book about Jigsaw some consider very sensationalized because the truth about what's happened is so serious and grounded. Mark hates the book, so she makes a deal with Mark to be less sensational if he can get her in contact with Jill. He agrees because apparently that's the thing that matters to him, except actually he kidnaps Miss Jenkins and puts her in a cell, which will probably keep her stories very sensationalized in the future. And it's there that we learn that she's Will's sister, which is weird. Meanwhile, the feds unscramble the tape I mentioned seven hours ago and realize Mark is a killer and he... Well, he kills all the feds. This includes throwing hot coffee in Lindsay's poor face, which uh, can't catch a damn break from Jigsaw's throwing evil shit in it. Mark then grabs Peter's severed hand and puts a bunch of fingerprints everywhere and burns the place down, even though five minutes earlier Dan pointed out that they'd already determined Peter's fingerprints were from a dead guy's hand, and so he believed that they were planted. 
somebody told this to Dan. He didn't figure that out on his own, but I guess it couldn't hurt for Mark to try again in case they all forgot. Also, I guess it turns out that Mark knew Amanda was there the night the meth head accidentally killed Gideon, and so he wrote her the letter she read back in Saw 3 that I didn't mention because I didn't think it mattered. It said that she needed to kill Dr. Lin, which actually does kind of explain why she was being such a friggin' weirdo in that movie. And otherwise, Mark would have revealed the truth to Kramer. How Mark could possibly have known any of this is unclear, but he does. And that's what leads to Amanda's failure of the game and ultimately her death. You got jigsawed. But wait! There's more! In Jill's sixth envelope was Mark's picture, I guess, in case Jill forgot what he looked like, and Jill sneaks up behind Mark and electrocutes him because she evidently rigged this random chair in this random zoo to have a random massive battery thing in it without Mark ever noticing, and it knocks Mark out, and while he's passed out, she puts the reverse bear trap from Saw 1 on his head and ties him up, and... If I remember correctly, that has to be, like, wired directly into your jaw, which we don't see happen to Mark. And again, how are random people this good at engineering and medical sh**? Well, to be fair, we do get some clarity on that front with a flashback where Kramer and Amanda make fun of Mark for building a shitty machine. So I guess they did have classes and Mark was a poor student, maybe? I mean, not that poor because his traps are the most elaborate yet, but he does skip corners on metal qualities, so... But anyway, Mark does escape from the trap, even though he does get half of his jaw ripped off, as one does, and, uh... I am so happy that the last movie is called The Final Chapter. Get it? It's a reverse bear trap. Yeah, no, I get it. That's... Yeah, that was really good. That's funny. Okay. You know, it's weird because I feel like this franchise has made so much money and yet Twisted Picture still hasn't updated their production stinger. I mean, that's just lazy. I mean, they sexed up the opening credits and put the whole movie into 3D, but they couldn't bother to get a higher res gif of a railroad spike. I mean, they should get sawed for squandering their every advantage. Anyway, the movie itself opens with the surprise reveal that Dr. Lawrence Gordon survived sawing his foot off in the first movie, which is... Fine, but why give away his inevitable surprise return as yet another Jigsaw accomplice at the end of this movie so early? It's like pronouncing Palpatine as alive in the opening crawl or something. Anyway, Lawrence survived his no foot by cauterizing his stump on a hot pipe that screams more loudly than he does, which is kind of disconcerting. Then we cut to an extremely public jigsaw trap that has nothing at all to do with anything, as far as I can tell. It's just a menage a trois gone wrong, where two men allow their mutual girlfriend to get sawed in half, and the public is shockingly willing to let this happen, and they do nothing to stop it besides half-assedly slapping at the reinforced glass. Meanwhile, Jill realizes that Mark survived the reverse bear trap head thing, so she runs to the cops and demands to speak to this guy who looks like a p***y version of Christian Bale, but talks like a p***y version of Ryan Gosling. Oh, good. Somehow he's named Matt, because apparently no other characters named that, even though it feels like the first white dude name they would have gone with. Uh, but I'm uh, very glad they fixed that oversight. Anyway, Matt works in internal affairs and is very interested in trading immunity for Jill in exchange for information that'll bring down Mark, because the two have a very tense history. Interestingly, Matt fulfills two classic movie tropes at the same time by cockily eating an apple while looking at a dead body. I mean, this guy's legit. Mark, for his part, abducts and kills a bunch of racist skinheads, which... Honestly, I could probably get behind. Fewer smokers, more Nazis, please. What is sad, though, is that one of the racists is portrayed by the late Chester Bennington of Linkin Park fame. He doesn't do much acting, but uh, the movie does cater to his strengths by letting him scream a lot, which he does very well. <laughs> Matt is called in to inspect the grisly aftermath and finds the damn... Reverse Bear Trap hat addressed to him. And fun fact, this movie has the worst acting in a series full of terrible acting. Handicap parking at the damn mall! And while this is all going on, we meet this uh, middle-aged white guy named Bobby who somehow claims to have survived a jigsaw trap and who is on a press tour touting his new book about the experience. He's basically preaching all the exact same stuff as Jigsaw about valuing life and whatever, except twist, he was never actually in a trap. The idea that somebody could value life without hacking all their arms off upsets Kramer so much, he confronts our boy Bobby dressed up as a, a 90s vanilla ice cosplayer. I'm a dirty... <laughs> Also, he, or more realistically, Mark, captures Bobby and forces him into another now-standard obstacle course of death. This obstacle course is set in an abandoned psych hospital. 
And the movie also features yet another abandoned manufacturing plant and an abandoned tow yard. And my final guess is that Jigsaw has killed 15% of the population by this point, And the vast majority of everybody else has moved somewhere where they can smoke in peace without fear of being forced to saw off their nose while simultaneously wolfing down an Arby's beef and cheese or something. Bobby escapes his first trap by swinging over a spike pit to safety, even though realistically he could have just easily lowered himself gently to the ground at, since like at full extension, he's like three inches above the spikes. But that wouldn't be very dramatic, would it? Then Bobby needs to pull a fish hook with an attached key out of his public his throat. But that's not Jigsaw enough though apparently because there's an added twist where if she yells too loud or the time runs out she'll get spiked to death. Both happen to some extent and she dies and Bobby yells at her dead corpse about yelling too much when you know the fish hook was ripping up her insides but like also Bobby you ran out of time anyway? She would have died either way. Honestly, she probably should have yelled more. In the next room, Bobby needs to do a squat to keep his lawyer from getting spikes in her eyes. And he fails because apparently he skipped leg day and also the machine he's squatting stabs him in the side. Then he goes to another room where the floor is mostly gone and his buddy has been blindfolded and the two must navigate a series of planks to get a key in the middle that'll free the friend before he falls and or time runs out and he gets hung. Again, Bobby fails because he really sucks at this. In the next room, Bobby has to rip out a couple of teeth and he finally succeeds before heading into the final room to save his wife by sticking hooks in his pecs and climbing up a chain rope thing. In this, he also fails because he skipped chest day and the hooks rip all the way through his girly pecs. I expected more from a boondock saint, but uh, apparently they're much better at killing than saving. Each day, we will spill their blood! Also again, throughout the pageantry, Really wonderful. Jigsaw dolls flying around, windows exploding, entire ovens springing up out of the ground and shit. I mean, just well done, Imagineers. Bobby's game again highlights how unfair these have become. Like, okay, the publicist and the lawyer and the friend maybe lied, but the wife has no idea. Her only crime was believing her husband. And for that horrific mistake, she's burned alive in an oven? This is yet another true Kramer jigsaw trap, not an accomplice bastardation, by the way, which means... Even Kramer apparently isn't above changing the rules of his own damn game when it suits him, you freaking dick. During this whole thing, Mark and Matt have been playing a game of cat and mouse, culminating in Mark, no, M no, Matt, getting secret auto chain gun to death, a la Breaking Bad, and Mark stabbing every single person at the police station, including the coroner who'd recently bragged about getting to see every Jigsaw murder victim. And now he is one. Ugh. And this was all just so that Mark could find Jill and hook her up to the freaking reverse bear trap. And for once, the thing actually kills somebody, ending the series' longest lasting erection. Hooray. Oh, and a whole SWAT team in the psych ward dies from gas because I guess the SWAT team doesn't bring along gas masks in this universe. It's good to see the police force returning to their, hey, why don't we just charge a jigsaw building and hope that there's no booby traps? Roots. To, the, to their roots of that. Murder spree completed, Mark heads outside where TWIST! He's attacked by three pig people, one of whom is Dr. Lawrence, just like we all expected. Turns out he's been working with Kramer the whole time, which I guess partially explains the medical expertise required for some of these traps, but no word on what happened to Lawrence's wife or kid or like his day job. Oh, what a big tootsie. Lawrence leaves Mark in the original saw bathroom, which is now just overflowing with bodies and feet and stuff. Then Lawrence throws away the saw, locks the door, and turns off the lights, leaving Mark to his fate. And for the millionth time, we get a bunch of flashbacks to the series highlights, as if we're supposed to be nostalgic for all that horrific gore. More likely, it's the producers flashing back through all the places that made them rich, like, Hey, remember that scene? We grossed over 100 million because of that needle pit. <laughs> and you idiots paid us to watch it! Thank you for being a friend. Side note, nobody in this entire movie mentions the triple FBI homicide at the end of Six. I guess none of them had families or friends or like actual job responsibilities. Or maybe more realistically, that sort of thing is so common in this universe that three federal officers being stabbed and then burned can be written off as a bad Monday. And that's it. That's the, uh, that's the end of the series, right? I can go home now? Game over? Ah, damn it! Oh, okay, we upgraded the logo, and it's in 4K, wow. Mm. And we've shifted from uh, muted grays to some warm colors, that's cool. Oh, it's directed by the guys that did Daybreakers and Predestination, that's pretty cool. Those are cool movies. Have you ever thought, I want to eat an apple and oh. kill and protect my so baby. So you guys didn't, you guys didn't pay to download this? No longer we 
were just watching on Peacock with ads. The new pill from Procter and Procter and Johnson and Johnson. Delicious. Okay, well, unlike literally every other Saw movie, this one doesn't start with a trap, but rather a car chase that results in a foot chase through an abandoned warehouse. Okay, some things never change. They corner the guy named Edward on the roof, but he's holding a remote trigger of some kind. And the middle-aged white cop who shows up to stop him, only referred to by his last name Halloran, thankfully, commands the other cops to shoot the trigger out of Edward's hand because apparently they're all the most crack shot elite sniper cops in the history of the world. And well, they actually do shoot the trigger out of Edward's hand, but he's already pressed the button, evidently starting a new game for five randos. Well, actually one of the cops did accidentally shoot Edward in the chest, which sure seems like a pretty reasonable mistake, but maybe it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> hmm? Saw twist much? Twist on the saw? We then, of course, cut to the aforementioned five people who have buckets on their heads and are chained to a wall with just like so many saws. This isn't your grandma's saw, baby. This is all the saws. They're slowly dragged towards the saw wall, but they're told if they give a little blood, they can survive. Four of them figure out they can just kind of nick themselves on the saw blades, but the fifth guy straight pass the hell out and never wakes up, which feels extremely unfair. In the next room, we learn they're probably in an abandoned barn, so it looks like the empty building epidemic is now rural. Still chained, they're dragged again and told they need to confess to letting a woman die after stealing her purse with her inhaler or something. And one of the women sort of confesses, but they'll all get hung to death unless she actively chooses to stick herself with one of three syringes, one of which has a cure to a poison in her blood, the other is a placebo, and one is acid. And she chooses none of them. So the white guy just stabs her with all three. She dies. The other three live. In the next room, the white guy tries to leave via a door that says no exit, and of course, gets his leg caught in a vice. Similarly, the other two wander into a silo that fills with grain and then drops a bunch of blades, which feels like unnecessary overkill and makes me think that it might just be Jigsaw's laundry chute. It's pretty lame. To be saved, the white guy pulls a lever that fully cuts his leg off, and it hurts, and the other two are saved, and they move on. In the next room, we learn that the black guy sold Kramer's nephew a faulty motorcycle, and the dude crashed because the brakes didn't work, and also he apparently drove out into an intersection instead of coasting to a stop somewhere safe. The black guy gets dropped into a way, way overly elaborate spinning top of death thing that kills him, despite the remaining woman's incredibly athletic attempt to climb into the rafters and shove some rebar into the machine. I mean, it doesn't work because nothing does, but it's still very damn impressive. And while this is going on, Halloran and another cop named Keith find the passed out dead guy hanging from a bridge and are now fully aware that another game is afoot. All signs point to John Kramer being behind the game, but that's crazy, because he's been dead for 10 years. Right? Simultaneously, we meet another middle-aged white dude named Logan, which isn't crazy unique, but much better than like Dave or something. And Logan, along with a tattooed John Wick phone operator looking chick named Eleanor, assist Halloran and Keith in their investigation as morticians. Logan and Keith were in Fallujah together, where we learned that Logan was captured and tortured, but not before killing three Taliban, which is pretty impressive considering the Taliban operate in Afghanistan and Fallujah's in Iraq, so... Thanks for your service. You'd make a good detective. Halloran suspects Eleanor and or Logan are behind the killings, partially because Eleanor somehow owns a big ass abandoned warehouse full of jigsaw traps of her own. But don't worry, she's just a fan and the traps are merely fun recreations. Again, allowing us to reminisce about all the good times we had watching people's chests get ripped open. She also, of course, has a replica of the reverse bear trap because the producers still think that's the coolest trap they've ever come up with. But guys, it isn't. If it can be explained as a reverse version of a trap that already exists in real life, that's not inventive. It's like ending this movie with a reverse gun. When Halloran and Keith find and inspect the warehouse, they discover another body and determine that, yeah, Eleanor is probably Jigsaw. To make things worse, they exhume John's body and find Edward in the casket, which I think is quite literally impossible to do without disturbing the earth around it. Logan decides Halloran is actually Jigsaw and uh, proves to Keith that the bullet that shot Edward not on the hand came from Halloran's type of gun. Additionally, Halloran has a sketchy cop history and the people involved in the game appear to be connected to Halloran's past. Oh, and they find a bunch of jigsaw-shaped skin pieces in Halloran's freezer, which, like, they could have led with that, probably. Later, Logan discovers Eleanor hiding at his house and she claims that she found the barn somehow and she believes that she and Logan should go there to stop the game themselves. Logan says they should probably call the cops, but Eleanor counters that, no, they're corrupt, which makes sense for, like, 
a second until you remember Logan is actively working with Keith. But not before taking out three Taliban. They head to the barn and Halloran of course follows them. Meanwhile, back in that stupid game, the woman wedges her way through another locked door only to be knocked out by another pig person we learn is in fact John Kramer. Why did he wear a pig mask in this abandoned barn only to reveal himself 30 seconds later? Because pigs are scary! <laughs> Kramer then reveals the woman who I'll begrudgingly reveal is named Anna was his next door neighbor and a few years ago she smothered her own baby and blamed it on her husband who went nuts and killed himself. Similarly, the white dude named Ryan was a was a dick when he was a kid and sort of maybe caused his friends to have a car accident which feels not very comparable. Kramer loads a shotgun with a single shell, puts it in the middle of the room, and tells them their salvation is in there. And Anna reaches the gun first because she's the only one with both feet. And when she tries to shoot, Ryan it backfires because, oh no, reverse gun is real! And she shoots herself in the face and inadvertently destroys the keys to their chains which were housed in the shell all along. Classic jigsaw. Take f***ing saw. Meanwhile, Logan and Eleanor reach the barn and face off with Halloran. Eleanor escapes, but Logan and Halloran somehow get captured in, in a trap. They must confess something or they'll get their heads lasered off. Logan admits he accidentally mislabeled Kramer's x-rays back in the day and caused his cancer to go unnoticed for longer than it should have. But evidently, that's not enough, and he gets lasered to death. Halloran admits to letting innocent people die as a cop, and the laser stops, but then Logan gets up off the floor and reveals that he is Jigsaw! And he faked his death, and now Halloran is going to die because Halloran's sh police work allowed Edward to go free back in the day, and then Edward killed Logan's wife. He also shows Halloran that he has his confession on tape, but, like, Halloran doesn't name specific names, and Logan kills him anyway, so none of that matters. But good for you, Logan. Whatever helps you sleep at night. You really love that guy, huh? The weirdest part of this twist is it turns out that the game we've been watching was actually 10 years ago, but the game they've been investigating is merely an exact modern-day replica. In the original game, Logan was the passed out guy and Kramer let him live because he realized mislabeling x-rays was more of an honest mistake than something intentionally evil, like, like smoking. I'm a dirty And as usual, Logan becomes one of Kramer's earliest disciples. We never actually see the modern day version of this game, just the mangled aftermath corpses that we didn't recognize as different people because they had their heads sawed off and stuff. And that explains how Kramer is alive in the old game, and the reason he seems alive in the new one is because Logan is apparently a master at Pro Tools because he builds new Jigsaw tapes from the old audio recordings of old Kramer tapes. I'm a dirty... I'm a dirty... I'm a dirty... Take f***ing saw. And I do wonder how Logan never made an appearance in the first seven movies. I mean, they seem to be saying that he predates Amanda and Mark and Lawrence, so is he just standing slightly off screen in each movie. Maybe he's standing next to Lawrence who also basically never appears in any flashbacks. Also not really sure why Logan lay dormant for 10 years before deciding to kill Edward and Halloran. Seems like he could have avenged his wife at any point. We literally never learn where John's body is. Does Logan have it in his house? Is it in one of the million abandoned warehouses or schools or psych wards or tow yards or barns? <sighs> there was literally no point in stealing the body and replacing it with Edward's other than for a fun twist for the audience. Can I leave now? Please? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. You're free to go, but please don't tell anybody about this. Well, okay. How do I get out of the trap? It's literally just a dog leash. Oh. Huh. Thanks for coming downtown. Why don't you just start at the beginning? Okay, well, it opens with... Not a trap, but rather 4th of July fireworks, which is pretty, and we do start with a middle-aged white guy, but this middle-aged white guy has a fun hat, so... Turns out he's a cop, and he immediately finds himself chasing a purse snatcher into the sewers, which seems like a bad idea, and uh, unsurprisingly, he gets grabbed by a pig person. He wakes up with his tongue in a vice, and is told he'll get hit by a train if he doesn't rip out his own tongue as punishment for continual lying on the witness stand. He, like 99% of people in these movies, Fails. Interestingly, this new killer doesn't use the Billy the Puppet doll that Jigsaw used, which I just learned the name of, and he doesn't speak in an artificially deep voice, but rather a weird, high Kermit the Frog knockoff. Today, it is you who will be railroaded. Someday we'll find it. He also has a new doll that's a pig cop because, get it? 
Anyway, smash cut to Chris Rock's character named Zeke, dressed as a janitor and giving his thoughts on why Forrest Gump is a questionable movie that could never be made today, namely because Jenny only has sex with a special needs guy after she gets AIDS and like, stay in your lane, Zeke. I'm the one who gets to make fun of movies. Anyway, Zeke and three other dudes rob some drug dealers only to be immediately caught by the cops and we learn that Zeke himself is a cop and was undercover. He gets stereotypically yelled at by his unstereotypically attractive captain named Angie for being too stereotypically a loose cannon. And so Zeke gets stereotypically assigned a new rookie partner named William. And I know we already had a Will in this series, but this one is in wider middle age. So, it, you know, it's fine. As it turns out, Zeke is immensely disliked by the rest of the police force because he ratted out a fellow officer named Pete. And yes, we also did have a middle-aged white cop named Pete, but I, I guess he died, so... It's fine. Zeke unfairly turned Pete in for literally murdering an innocent witness in an active investigation. Like, straight up shot a guy dead in his own apartment with no provocation. Like, surely of all the things to rat somebody out for, cold-blooded murder would, would be one of the least controversial? I mean, was Pete just like so much fun at karaoke night or something? But whatever. Zeke trusts no one, especially after this other cop, Detective Fitch, refused to provide Zeke with backup a few years ago, which led to Zeke getting shot in his tummy. Oh, and also, Zeke is the son of former Captain Marcus Banks, and if it feels like I'm giving a lot of backstory, it's because this entire film is basically one big backstory machine trap delivered through awkward conversation that largely boils down to, you know this key element of my backstory, Dad. I know, son, but you know this key element of mine, and that's where our conflict lies. Indeed, we are both conflicted because of our backstories, which we should restate again, just in case we've forgotten. Twelve years ago, I turn in a dirty cop. I get a medal for it. Big f***ing deal. I also got a bullet and I got to look over my back for the rest of my career. It's not great. It doesn't help that Zeke is always at 100% full angry personality and displays strong emotion in every single freaking scene. I know there's a serial killer on the loose, but also I get why nobody likes you. The best parts of this movie are the few instances where Zeke calms down for a second and delivers the only genuinely funny lines we've ever heard in this entire franchise, like, you can ride a lot of dick before dusk. By the way, dick before dusk is the Richard Linklater film I never knew I needed. One weird thing is that several critics point to Spiral as a bold new direction for the franchise, presumably because there's hip hop music and some characters can now safely drop in words because they finally cast some non-white actors, but it's directed by the same guy that did two through four. So it's not like they got David Fincher or something. I'm a dirty <laughs> Anyway, turns out that the dead guy with the hat was a cop named Boswick who just so happens to be Zeke's only friend in the whole world. We know this because Zeke yells that they went to games together, which is about as personal a connection as two straight men can have. And besides their mutual love of non-specific sports team watching, why a well-known liar cop would be best friends with a well-known narc cop isn't really explained. Also, the cops for a long time assumed Boswick's corpse is actually a bum corpse because only bums can get hit by trains, I guess. But Zeke is dubious because not a lot of bums wear Fitbits. Zeke is a good detective. Zeke takes lead on the investigation and receives several cute boxes all tied up with strings mailed to him containing clues. The killer uses jigsaw iconography, even though as somebody points out, Kramer's been dead for forever, but... Also, there have been a half dozen Jigsaw accomplices at this point, so why even point that out? Uh, but no, to clarify, this must be a copycat because as someone claims, Kramer didn't target cops, even though half his victims are cops. Seriously, there are so many dead cops in these movies. Okay, maybe Zeke is a bad detective. So they start investigating, and the first thing we learn is that Zeke claims to not even look at porn for more than five hours, which like, I sure freaking hope not, Zeke. Also, they decide to look into a drug user named, I think it's Spees or something, because he was seen snatching that purse that got Boswick and his hat into the train tunnel. They head to Spees' favorite meth house and trick the dealer into getting blasted in the eyes with paint so they can bum rush him, break his leg, and gain like no information. At some point, the mean old cop Fitch figures out the location of Spees and refuses to tell Zeke and goes to get him himself, alone. Predictably, Fitch gets captured and stuck in a device that rips his fingers off before electrocuting him to death. Then the killer apparently grabs William off screen and mails his skin to Zeke, which is I think the moment that all of us in the theater realized how this movie was gonna end, but I'll leave you in suspense. Also, Zeke's dad goes missing at some point, and also, also, sexy Captain Angie goes down to the basement to check on some old files, but ends up in a trap where she gets hot tar poured on her hot face so that she can only escape if she 
severs her spine, which I'm pretty sure will still kill you. She dies, but Zeke valiantly tries to give her mouth to mouth anyway, which is gross, but I mean, I kind of get it. Shut up! So cops are dying or disappearing left and right, and the movie keeps pointing out that it must be because a bunch of cops became dirty when Article 8 was passed, which I don't think is a real law, but rather something made up for this movie. I think it's like a qualified immunity thing, but they never really explain it. Spiral sort of tries to indict cops and police brutality, I guess, but also these cops are targeted by a literal serial killer, and the hero is a cop who does a ton of police brutality, so it's, it's all a bit muddled. Also, for whatever it's worth, Zeke's dad and Angie both supported this ambiguous but apparently corrupt policy. Eventually, Zeke himself is captured and wakes up chained to a pipe across from Pete. Zeke sees a hacksaw on the ground and uses it to, to grab a nearby lockpick that's just sitting there, and he easily escapes his chains. He then tries to save Pete, who has been let out of jail for that whole murder thing, from a wind machine that just blasts broken glass into Pete's back, which is pretty wild. Shockingly, Zeke fails. Then he heads upstairs where it's revealed that the jigsaw copycat killer is William. Yep. William is actually the son of the dude Pete murdered 15 years ago, and he's hoping to reform the police by maiming all the dirty ones. His only real connection to Kramer and Jigsaw is that he sort of, kinda thinks he could maybe reform cops by ripping out their tongues and cutting off their fingers and stuff, just like Jigsaw would have maybe done. He says, John Kramer was right. The spiral is a symbol of change and evolution and progress, which I don't think he ever said, but I guess William is supposed to be crazy, so it makes sense for him to misunderstand Kramer's intention. In fact, during one of the little videos earlier in the film, William mentions a bunch more people will die. Not a bunch more people will suffer or learn life lessons the hard way, so clearly William doesn't get it, or more likely everybody who created this movie doesn't get it, or maybe I don't get it. I don't know. And now more than ever, how does this dude know how to rig such elaborate traps? And why even bother? Just hold a gun to dirty cops' heads and say, rip out your tongue or I'll kill you. And also, you know, stop being a bad cop, please. That would be just as effective and way more efficient. But whatever. William hopes to work with Zeke to help reform the police department further via ripping their dicks off or whatever, but before Zeke can make a decision, William reveals that he has Zeke's dad rigged up to some thing that drains his blood. Zeke only has one bullet in his gun, and he can either shoot William and let his dad die, or shoot a weird, faraway spiral target and save his dad like some sh carnival game. He shoots the target, but William has called the cops who bust into the room and shoot Zeke's dad anyway. Zeke tries to punch the out of William, but William still gets away somehow. Seems like he'd be really easy to catch since he's just taking an elevator downstairs and the cops have surrounded the building and also, he's right there! J just go get him! But apparently, not. So you were forced to watch all eight Saw movies and then you escaped and then went ahead and saw the ninth one voluntarily? I just needed some closure. Well, you must be really excited for Saw 10 then, huh? What? Do you know who I am? I'm you, and Jigsaw, and a cop, I guess. Twist, twist, twist. <laughs> Game over. Ah!